This morning I want to read two passages. One of them is recorded in the bulletin. The other we're going to start with is Ephesians chapter 6 and then from the book of Revelation chapter 12. Join me in a moment of prayer. Father God, as we read your word, let it be alive with your spirit. As we listen, as we hear, let our hearts be alive to receive from you what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's start with a passage that's quite well known, Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 10 through verse 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And he goes on from there to talk about putting on the full armor of God. And then I want to read the last verse of Revelation chapter 12. It's verse 17. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Today, as we've noted, is Remembrance Day. And we remember those who served in Canada's armed forces and who gave their lives for their country, for their communities, for the cause of freedom, and to bring deliverance. And even today, there are soldiers from Canada patrolling in Afghanistan and paying a price there. Now, we honor them, the men and women who are part of that, and we honor what they've done and the sacrifice that they make and continue to make and have made. Now, two wars in particular have dominated Remembrance Day over the years. And they are the two world wars, the First World War and the Second World War. And Remembrance Day came out of the First World War. The reason that we commemorate it on November 11th and typically aim to have a service in silence at cenotaphs and so forth and other places at 11 o'clock is because on the 11th month of November, the 11th day, and at the 11th hour, the armistice was signed and the war to end all wars came to a close. And part of the purpose of remembering was precisely that, that it was meant to be the war that would end all wars because it was an incredibly awful war. It was the first time that the whole world had experienced a war and incredible amount of death and destruction and pain and suffering that took place. And I think the world at that time was really in shock at what had happened. But of course, it was not the war to end all wars because 20 years later, another war started, the Second World War, another world conflict that spread across the whole globe and involved millions upon millions of people. Huge cost, again, of human life, destruction, pain, and sorrow once again. There are none who are left from the First World War. And the ranks of those who fought in the Second World War are rapidly growing thinner as that generation passes. But there are people in this congregation who remember them because they grew up in Holland and lived through that war as children and as young people. And they saw what it was like to live under Nazi occupation. And when they were liberated, and Canadian troops played a huge role in that, it was an incredible time of rejoicing at that liberation. And so to this day, in the Dutch heart, there is a warm place for Canada, for Canada's flag, for Canada's soldiers. Those two world wars in the last century were huge, huge conflicts that involved vast armies and loss of life, and as I said, crossed the entire globe. Especially in the Second World War, I think we knew that we were fighting evil against the darkness that had covered Europe. And we're fighting for freedom and for liberation. 
We have been part of conflicts since then, but thankfully we have not experienced a whole world at war since the 1940s in that same way. And we can give thanks to God for that. But did you know that there is a world war underway? That the world is at war, that we live in a war, that, that is still being waged, and we are part of it. It is a spiritual war, but very real nonetheless. It involves every human being on this planet, and the stakes are higher than any other war ever waged. Because the stakes are the souls, the eternal lives of men and women, boys and girls, every human being who has ever lived and ever will until the Lord returns. The eternal future of our world and of our lives is at stake in this world and we live in a world that is at war. And tremendous powers are engaged in that struggle. In my devotional time this past week, I've been reading from A.W. Tozer. He was a well-known evangelical preacher and writer, American. He died in 1963. He was American, but he, his last church was a Missionary Alliance Church in Toronto, Avenue Road Alliance Church. And he was talking about that war, a world at war, in one of the devotionals that I read. And it, he had this to say. Our fathers believed in sin and the devil and hell as constituting one force. And they believed in God and righteousness and heaven as the other. This is in the world that is a battleground. By their very nature, these forces were opposed to each other forever in deep, grave, irreconcilable hostility. Humans, our fathers held, had to choose sides. They could not be neutral. For them, it must be life or death, heaven or hell. And if they chose to come out on God's side, they could expect open war with God's enemies. The fight would be real and deadly and would last as long as life continued here below. People looked forward to heaven as a return from the wars, a laying down of the sword to enjoy in peace the home prepared for them. That's a whole different way of looking at the world, isn't it? We're not used to thinking of the world in that kind of way, typically, are we? Not even as believers, we don't typically think of the world in that way. We often love this world and all of the comforts that this world has to offer to us. And in fact, sometimes when trouble comes our way and we struggle and we walk through the valley of the shadow of death or whatever the case may be, very often what will happen is we wonder, why isn't life easier? Why isn't it more comfortable? And we may even get angry with God when it isn't. And that's because we don't think of this world in its brokenness and sin and we don't think of this world as a battleground because you would not expect ease and comfort on a battleground. And you would expect trials and troubles and things to come our way. But we're in a war. There's a war going on around us, a world war. And we are part of it. It is a war that probably started before the world was created, when Satan, who was perhaps the highest ranking angel in heaven, rebelled against God. He was determined to find independence, to be independent of God, determined to do life his own way and to make himself like God and to take God's place. Does that sound familiar? It should. Because in some of the sermons I've been preaching, we've been talking about that human drive for independence from God and to be like God. That was the temptation 
that Satan as a serpent put in front of Eve in the Garden of Eden in the first place. The temptation to be independent from God, to be like him so that you wouldn't need him. You would know the difference between good and evil yourself. You wouldn't need God's revelation to guide you. You could be like God. And Eve, of course, fell for that, as did Adam. And we continue to fall for that. We have in our hearts that same kind of drive. And it came from that temptation, from Satan. And it led to sin and to the fall and to the curse that is on this world. And death and destruction entered into it. And we've lived with it ever since. In fact, every war that has ever been fought or has had to be fought, because you have to take a stand by times, has come about because of what happened there. Because of that temptation to be like God. Because of what the serpent did in the Garden of Eden. Darkness there that stirs then our hearts and lies behind the destruction of war. It really was power of darkness that we were fighting in the Second World War. And there are powers of darkness that are at work all the time in this world. Now, Satan's war is actually with God. It is God that he wants to set himself up against. It is God who he wants to be like and who he wants to topple off the throne. But he has taken the war to this world and to humanity because God made this world and it was good and because God made human beings in his image to be the crown of creation. And so hating God, he hates the things that God loves and that God has made and he hates human beings in particular because of the fact that we are the crown of creation, because of the fact that we bear God's image. And that's why he took his war against God into this world then, because he is hitting God where he knows it will hurt, to take from him his people who he has made, and to make them Satan's people, his own people. And so what happens is we live in occupied territory, Although Jesus has won the victory over death and hell, the final victory is yet to come. The final enemy has yet to be put under his foot. That is the enemy of death. uh, death. And so what we live like today has been sometimes described as similar to what happened in the Second World War. When the Allied troops landed at Normandy, were able to establish a presence there that they could not be driven out, And at that point, the end of the war was in sight, though it was yet a year to come. And while people still lived in occupied territory, they knew that liberation was coming. And that's where we live today then. And we wait for the renewal of all things described in the last chapters of the book of Revelation, the coming of the new Jerusalem, where heaven and earth are joined and death is no more, chaos and destruction is done, wars are over, and the war of the Lamb is over as well, and there is peace and joy and rejoicing as we live forever with him. Now that war that we are engaged in is described in Revelation chapter 12. It is the story of the woman who is giving birth to a child and a dragon who wants to destroy first the child and then her. So if you start reading at verse 4, it says that the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. That's the Messiah. That's Jesus. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels 
with him. And so it goes on to describe how he pursued the woman, but God hid the woman from him. And so in his anger, we have verse 17, which we read earlier. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. What you have there is what was described already in Genesis chapter 3. When God puts curse on the serpent, he says, I will put enmity, war, between you and the woman and between your offspring and the woman's offspring, and you will, crush, you will, you will strike his heel, but the woman's offspring will crush your head. And so Jesus is the woman's offspring who crushes his head and brings an end to the war. But Satan, the serpent, and his offspring strike at his heel and continue to strike at the offspring of the, of the woman because her other offspring, as it is described in there, are those who Jesus bought. You and me, believers, those who follow Jesus Christ and seek to serve him with our whole hearts. We are the offspring of the woman described there and the ones against whom this, the dragon went off to make war. That's why we're in a war. And as believers, we are particularly the focus of the war because of the fact that we are on the other side. And there are two sides. There's no neutral ground. So that is what's being described there then in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. I want to make a number of observations about it before I talk about some of the implications of what it means to live in a war, in a world that is at war. And the first is we need to know that we're in a war. Because if we don't, we won't understand life. We won't understand why things go the way they do. We won't understand why when we step out in God, things happen and come against us and we face trials and difficulties and obstacles come up. And we won't understand why we can't find more comfort and we'll become angry when we can't find it. We will be expecting what the old hymn called beds of ease for our lives. We will come under attack when we are not expecting it, when we are unprepared, when we don't have our armor on that was described in Ephesians chapter 6 by Paul. And then we'll blame God for what's happening as if it was his fault. But we live in a war zone. And so we should not be a, a, a surprised if the battle comes our way. As a matter of fact, if the battle does not come our way, it probably means that we have been neutralized. He doesn't have to worry about us. Satan doesn't. And he can pay his attention elsewhere. So we need to know that we're in a war. And we need to know that in our families, for instance, that we... I, as a father and as a husband, need to be praying for my wife and my children because there's a war on. And so I need to engage in that. So the second thing, then, is everyone has to choose which side they are on. There is no room for neutrality. You are either with Jesus or you are not. You either belong to Jesus or you do not. And if you don't, then you belong to Satan, not to him. Because there's two sides here in this war. And there's no neutral territory there's no neutral nations. There's no neutral people. And the battle is about life and death. It's about heaven and hell. The stakes are huge because your eternal future, my eternal future, the eternal future of our friends and our neighbors, the people we work with, is at stake in this war. Because you're headed one of two directions. The third thing then is that the battle is spiritual, but it affects the physical realm as well. There is a spiritual dimension to life that we ignore at our peril. And that's one of the reasons why I talked earlier that we need to know that we're in a war because of that spiritual dimension. We have, I don't want us to live in fear, but we do have an enemy, and he seeks either to harm us or to neutralize us. Harm can include at least some illnesses. Poor health, withering finances, attacks on our children, 
especially in the vulnerability of birth when that takes place. There are obstacles to overcome in our lives. And behind them often are spiritual strongholds, powers and principalities, things that Paul talked about in Ephesians chapter 6. Be strong, put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. That's the physical. That's the stuff you can touch. But our struggle is against the rulers, against the authorities, against the, the, the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And so we need to be aware that behind obstacles can stand spiritual strongholds that need to be dealt with and that we need then, as Paul talks elsewhere, spiritual weapons, not weapons of this world to wage war. So Satan will try to cause us harm. It's a spiritual battle that takes place in the physical then and shows up in our lives in physical ways, but he also will try to neutralize us. He'll try to take us out of the battle, to render us useless, to lull us to sleep so that we have no awareness that there's a battle underway. No awareness, perhaps, of the supernatural, that it even exists. That's one of the, his favorite things, is to get us to believe that it just doesn't exist anyway, and we go our merry way as if it didn't exist. And meanwhile, he's at work behind the scenes. Powerless Christians, then, who don't realize either the battle is on, or that they have authority in it, because authority is one of our greatest weapons. It's authority that Jesus gave to his disciples and gives to us as well in our lives to exercise in the areas that he's given us authority over and to exercise that spiritual authority. There will be temptations and that will come at us and they will keep coming at us that take us out when we give ourselves to them. There will be cares of the world that he will throw our way and, and that he'll whisper in our ear then that, you know, life is too hard and just give up and, and just settle for this and, and so on. And the cares of this world draw our attention away from Jesus and what he wants. And so there's an unwillingness to pay the price of joining in that battle for souls and we become lovers of comfort. We don't want the mess and we don't want the discomfort. That's what happens if we do not realize that the battle is spiritual, but it affects the physical realm. He will seek to harm us and to neutralize us. The fourth thing then is that we have a role to play in that war. We have a task. It is the ministry of Jesus. Do you remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 4 when he announced his ministry, reading from the scroll set at the book of Isaiah, the Spirit of the, of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll and he said, This day, this scripture is fulfilled in front of you in himself. That was his mission. That's what he did. And doesn't that sound like some of what we were talking about when, for instance, Canadian troops were among the troops that liberated Holland and brought freedom there? And there in the physical you see what Jesus is saying he is doing and his task is. We set captives free then from Satan's grip rather than from governments and from men because our battle is spiritual, but it is a battle for freedom and for deliverance. And Jesus gave that task then to his disciples. You may remember two occasions in the New Testament Gospels where he sends forth the 12 and the 70 or 72 to go out and do what he did. And he gave them authority then to do three things to preach that the kingdom of God is near, to heal the sick, and to cast out demons. And that's what we are still called to do. We have a role to play in that war. To preach Jesus then. To tell people that he is close by because he is close to people, even as they cannot see him, are unaware of him, have no thought for him whatsoever, because the God of this world has put a veil over their eyes. And so we pray then, for that veil to be removed. And we tell them, Jesus is close. And we pray for the eyes to be open to see that he's there, nearby. 
to heal the sick, that is to say, to free people physically in all kinds of ways. And in this church, we've had a particular calling to heal the broken, especially emotionally and psychologically. But I wonder sometimes, as I think about this list of three things, three tasks that Jesus has given, we pray for physical healing, and we see physical healings by times, but I wonder if we should do more of that and expect more of that, because that's part of the task that God has given us. And then to cast out demons, that's to free people spiritually from beings, spiritual beings who take people captive, lies behind often addictions in people's lives, ways of thinking that they cannot get out of, behaviors that they cannot break. Often what lies behind it are spiritual beings that create like strongholds that make, it, that make people captives then to ways of thinking and ways of living. That's what Jesus is talking about when he says to set the captives free. And so there may be patterns in people's lives too then of insufficiency and of fears or of illness or other things. And those again are spiritual strongholds that can hinder people in life. And part of casting out demons is to deal with those kinds of things so that people come free, are delivered spiritually, and it happens in the physical realm as well. So to preach Jesus, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, we're called to the task that Jesus was called to as he declared it in Luke chapter 4, as he gave it to his disciples in the Gospels, and as he gave it to the apostles as they went out from there into the early church in the Acts of the Apostles, and still is true today. So we need to know we're in a war. Everyone has to choose which side they're on. The battle is spiritual, but it affects the physical realm as well. And we have a role to play in that war with Jesus being his body then in this world to engage in that war on behalf of of the people that we love and that we know and who also live in the community around us. And if the world is at war, then that has implications for how we live. It means then that we should not just expect that life will always be comfortable. It means that we should expect that there will be trials that come. And in fact, that the more you try to step out in Jesus, the more trials will come your way. Because if you are not stepping out, you have been neutralized and Satan doesn't have to worry about you. It's like he's got you pinned down in this place so he could give his attention somewhere else. But the moment that you step out, you're going to run into obstacles. And we get dismayed by that and think, I must not have heard God. And sometimes that may be true, but more often than not, it really is the case that we have started to become dangerous. We've started to live in a way that Satan doesn't want us to live and to engage in a war that he doesn't want us to engage in. And so we are called then to do battle for our families and for our communities, to pray for peace and for safety, to pray for prosperity, to seek it in our communities. It is to stand spiritually then with mothers as children are born because that is one of the most vulnerable places when new life comes. And it is to stand spiritually in prayer and in other ways with people as they come into new life too. It's in those vulnerable places that we need to be engaged because the battle becomes strong there. And that's why certain things will happen along the way in this world. And so then we also need then as fathers and husbands and as leaders in, this, in the community to engage in prayer for those who are most vulnerable and to exercise the authority that God has given us, spiritual authority, for those who are most vulnerable. That's what we're called to do in this battle and in this war. We're called to engage in prayer and evangelism for the sake of souls, to come up against strongholds that keep people from seeing Jesus that keep them in bondage. We are called then to, 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 bring, to pray away that veil that blinds people so that they cannot see Jesus, so that they can find him, so that they can grow up in him. It is to engage then in evangelism and also in helping people to come to Jesus and to grow up and to know that there is a war that is going on and not to be afraid of it, and to, when we see obstacles that come in their lives, not to be afraid by that either, but to keep pushing on with them 
and encourage them to do so because it's a battle and we need to see it through. It means, too, that we need to make sacrifices. When a country is on a war footing, everyone contributes. In those great wars, everyone contributed. And so back home, farmers and women working in factories and so forth contributed to the war effort. And so we all must make sacrifices in similar ways and contribute to the war effort. Our resources go towards that effort. We pay a price, and as well as those on the front lines. So do those back home in the factories and in the farms. And so we pay a price too, and we make sacrifices along the way as well. We do that when we choose to live as Jesus has called us to live. And that puts us at odds then with the world around us and you will come under attack by times by people who do not understand why you live the way that you do. And I just want to say, don't cause yourself trouble unnecessarily by being uh, arrogant about it or pushing it in people's faces. But no matter what you do, no matter how humble you are, it will come your way by times. There will be people who you won't understand why they don't like you. But they sense the Spirit of Jesus about you, and they don't like the Spirit of Jesus, and they won't like you either. Jesus said that would happen. There's a price to be paid. And we pay that price then when we give our tithes and offerings towards this church and towards the ministry of this church, and we sacrifice to do that. We do that when we contribute in different ways to programs and ministries, to walking in people's lives and to doing things that enable people to do ministry or to grow themselves, and we participate in some of those things, we're paying a price because that's time we could have used for ourselves. That's time that we could have gone golfing or playing bridge or whatever the case might be. And people look at that and say, are you crazy for doing that? But we do that because we know the war that we're in and the value of it. We know the stakes that are there and we make those sacrifices. We set aside our own comfort by times for the sake of the gospel. And that may mean, for example, that we have to say to somebody, I am sorry. Even though we don't want to humble ourselves before them, but that's Jesus' way. And it may mean that we have to say to somebody and that we forgive them. I forgive you for the harm that you have done to me. And that we take that harm on ourselves and we pay a price by doing that rather than holding on to it and seeking revenge. We pay a price by setting aside our rights to our church, to our music, to our ways of doing things, whatever those may be, and opening instead the doors of the church to the people that God wants to call to himself, and opening the doors of our homes to people, and indeed of our hearts, even more important, our hearts, because you can be a do-gooder whose heart is not in it and where there's pride and arrogance. But if you love somebody and you give your heart to them, it's a whole different thing. It's a whole different door that you have opened. And so that becomes at a cost. And we pay a price then. Sometimes with people that we don't naturally love, wouldn't naturally associate with, but who God brings into and wants to bring into his family. And it will change things here and where it will get messy by times too. And we have to let go of some of that for the sake of the gospel. And we pay the price when we face trials. And we pay the price when we face temptations and we take our stand against that. We pay a price in this battle just as people did who we remember at Remembrance Day. But we do that because we know we live in a world at war, a spiritual war, a war where the stakes are huge, greater than any war that has ever been fought, because at stake is the eternal future of this world and of every person who lives in it. You, me, our children, our grandchildren, our neighbors, the people we work with. We do these things because we are the church, the body of Christ, and called to do what he did then as part of that war, as Satan himself makes war upon the saints.